Hello ladies and gentlemen, this new cancer program about public health education as superficial programs, new subject is a small cell carcinoma of the lungs, small cell carcinoma of the lungs. Our source book, the M.D. Anderson, Manual of Medical Oncology, Introduction, Small Cell Lung Cancer is a highly aggressive malignant epithelial tumor. Patients typically present with rapidly growing symptomatic disease and distant metastasis at diagnosis are common. Most cases are highly sensitive to chemotherapy but the disease frequently recurs and most patients will die of their disease. Small cell lung cancer remains therapeutic challenger. Epidemiology approximately 219,000 440 patients in United Nations states are diagnosed with lung cancer every year and approximately 159,390 will die of their disease. Small cell lung cancer currently accounts for approximately 13% of all lung cancers in the United States compared to its incidence in the 1980s when it represented 18% of cases Historically, a majority of patients with small cell lung cancer were male, but recent analyses show that equal numbers of men and women are affected, probably due to increasing use of tobacco among women starting in the 1960s. Risk factors. Cigarette smoking is the single most important risk factor for development of small cell lung cancer, it has been estimated that well over 90% of small cell lung cancers are attributable to cigarette smoking and in our experience it is rare. To see a non-smoking patient diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, passive smoker, the risk is related to both of duration and intensity of tobacco use and the risk for former smokers is lower than that for current smokers through still far higher than that of non-smokers. Some studies suggest that the risk of small cell lung cancer 
is greater for smoking women than for men other than the association of tobacco exposure to asbestos, benzene, coal, tar, coal tar, and radon gas has been associated with risk usually as co-carcinogens with tobacco. Smoking cessation Counseling is widely accepted method of primary prevention. Even after diagnosis of small cell lung cancer, smoking cessation should be encouraged as there is evidence of worse outcomes in patients who continue to smoke through and after treatment. Natural history and prognostic factors. Different uh, detail. Pathology. Yes. Clinical presentation and diagnostic evaluation. Because small cell lung cancer is rapidly growing and aggressive tumor tumors patients will often develop symptoms over a short period of time and are usually diagnosed within three months from onset of symptoms small cell lung cancer typically arises in the central airways and infiltrates the submucosa in contrast to the polypoid luminal occlusion seen with squamous cancers. The tumor gradually obstructs the bronchial lumen through extrinsic or endobronchial spread. Patient most frequently present with symptoms of dyspnea and persistent cough, hemoptysis and postobstructive pneumonia are relatively uncommon due the submucosal growth pattern of the tumor spread to the mediastinal lymph node is a hallmark of small cell lung cancer and syndromes resulting from mass effect are commonly seen including superior vena cava obstruction hoarseness resulting from recurrent laryngeal nerve compression Phrenic nerve palsy, dysphagia resulting from esophageal compression and stridor resulting from trial compression. Small cell lung cancer is the most common malignant cause of superior vena cava obstruction. Small cell lung cancer is often metastatic at presentation and patient may present with symptoms of metastatic disease, bone or right upper quadrant, abdominal pain, headache, caesaries, fatigue, and anorexia. Occasionally, patients with small cell lung cancer present with the paraneoplastic syndrome, which will be discussed in detail later. Initial radiographic images often show a large hilarmus with bulky mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Small cell lung cancer tumors are usually centrally located, although occasional peripheral satellite nodules are found. The initial clinical evaluation should in include a chest radiograph history and physical examination 
Pathologic Review, Chest X-ray, Computed Tomography, Scans of the Chest and Abdomen, Magnetic Resonance, Imaging, or Computer Tomography Scan of the Brain, a Bone Scan, and Baseline Laboratory Test, and so on. Detail continue. Stages and treatment limited stages disease. Extensive stage disease. Targeted agents recurrent disease. Prophylactic cranial irradiation. Special population and elderly and infant. And and oh, this this is small cell lung cancer summary. Despite much effort to identify more effective strategies for treatment, survival in small cell lung cancer has remained remained relatively stable over the past twenty years. The standard of care for both limited and extensive stage disease is etoposid and platin chemotherapy for a minimum of four courses, early integration of concurrent thoracic radiation is indicated for the patient with limited disease, PCI can be offered to patients who have disease control with initial treatment. Advances in treatment will likely require greater knowledge of the, this tumor's unique biology and the ability to target the abnormal phenotype. Currently, the greatest promise appears to be in combining relevant targeted agents with chemotherapy and many such trials are ongoing. That's all. And another lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States and worldwide. The high rate of mortality results from both the high incidence and the late stage of disease at diagnosis. It is estimated that in the year 20. 2009, approximately 219,440 new cases will be diagnosed and 159,390 uh, 100, Due to lung cancer will occur in the United States. These numbers represent approximately 15% of all new cancer cases and 28% of cancer death in the population. These statistics emphasize that lung cancer is the lethal disease with poor overall survival. Only 15% of patients diagnosed with lung cancer are alive five years later. More than 70% of patients will be diagnosed with advanced disease that is not amenable, amenable to curative therapy. Even those who present with early stage disease have a high rate of recurrence. Lung cancer is broadly divided into small cell lung cancer, 
and non-small cell lung cancer, approximately 85% of lung cancer is non small cell lung cancer. This chapter briefly describes the epidemiology, etiology, histology, prevention, and molecular biology of non-cell, non-small cell lung cancer. The major focus of the, this chapter is to describe and discuss the clinical presentation, diagnosis, staging, and treatment of non-small cell lung cancer based on current clinical knowledge with an emphasis on our approach to the management of non-small cell lung cancer. At the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, Epidemiology. Lung cancer is rarely diagnosed in people less than 35 years old. Incidence and death rates rise exponentially among patients older than 35, then approximately plateau among patients greater than 75 years old. Non-small cell lung cancer accounts for the greatest number of deaths from cancer in both men and women over age 60. Analysis of the incidence of smoking and lung cancer in the United States over the past century demonstrates parallel courses with the latency period of about 20 years between, between the former and later events. The current epidemic of lung cancer begin with a sharp increase in the incidence among men in the 1930s following the availability of manufactured cigarettes in the 1910s, the increase the lung cancer incidence among women did not start until the 1960s, again following an increase in exposure to tobacco, this time due to the changes in smoking practices after World War II. And by 1987, lung cancer surpassed breast cancer as the leading cause of cancer-related death in women. In the 1990, the incidence of lung cancer in the United States decreased among men. In women, the rates of lung cancer stabilized from 2003 to 2005. In the year 2009, the estimated ratio of male to female deaths due to lung cancer in the United States was 1.3 divide one. There is some evidence that women are at the greater risk for lung cancer. However, other studies have not confirmed, confirmed this finding. Smoking behaviors might also account for socio-economic and racial differences in lung cancer incidence declines in lung cancer since the 
1990 have been most pronounced in the individuals of all ethnic backgrounds with a college education and appear to correlate with the market decrease between 1992 and 2007 in secret consumption among people in the group. The highest incidence of lung cancer in the United States is in African Americans, males, although some of these high rate of cancer incidence is clearly attributable to smoking behaviors. Evidence suggests that the population might be more susceptible than others to the carcinogenic effect of the tobacco smoke. Etiology Smoking The casual relationship between tobacco smoke and lung cancer was established as early as the 1950s. In case control and later cohort studies, this evidence led to the 1964 report of the United States Surgeon. General concluding that smoking can cause lung cancer. Currently, it is estimated that 85 to 90 percent of lung cancer is due to due to smoking, but that uh, non-smokers who are exposed to secondhand smoke are also at the increased risk for lung cancer. Pipe and cigar smoking also increases the risk for lung cancer. The relative risk for lung cancer is current smokers is approximately 11 to 17 times higher than that for people who have never smoked. Although there is evidence for a dose-response relationship between smoking and lung cancer and risk dependence upon the duration and amount smoked. In addition, smoking cessation leads to decrease in lung cancer risk over time. Tobacco smoke is complex mixture of several thousand chemicals that includes multiply carcinogens and growth factors. The N-nitrosamines, nitrosamines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are the two major classes of tobacco-related inhalated carcinogens. And nitrosamines are formed during tobacco processing and pyrosynthesis. They originate from nicotine and the alkaloid arecoline chemicals derived from tobacco smoke cause lung tumors in experimental animals. The main nitrosation products of Nicotine are nicotine derived nitrosamine ketone and NNN, N nitrosonor nicotine. They are considered very strong lung carcinogens. The nitrosamines are activated through hydroxylation by the P450 enzyme system and exert the action through the formation of DNA adducts. The number of DNA adducts 
adducts, adux, form it is directly related to the number of cigarettes consumed. DNA that can remain in the system for as long as five years without significant change in heavy smokers. They can be responsible for as many as 100 mutations per cell genome. The polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, benz benzepirene and dimethylbenzantracene. This is very famous, dimethylbenzantracene. Anthracene are also significant chemical mutagenic carcinogenic substances that lead to the formation of DNA with that. Recent evidence has also identified the nicotine acetylcholine receptor as susceptibility. Susceptibility locus in lung cancer suggesting that nicotine simultaneously accounts for the addiction to smoking and is capable of driving tumorigenesis and metastasis in experimental system. Although smoking is clearly the highest, largest risk factor, 10 to 15 percent of cases of Non-small cell lung cancer occur in never smokers corresponding to approximately 20,000 deaths annually and making this category one of the top 10 causes of cancer mortality. Although in completely understood increasing focus has been place on this category of non-small cell lung cancer and several important facts are clear. First incidence increases with age, second no clear change in risk has occurred over time, third no clear gender bias exists, fourth among female never smokers large population differences exist with higher risk in East Asian countries, especially China. In addition to second-hand smoke exposure, several other agents have also been linked to the development of lung cancer. Asbestos. Asbestos exists in many natural forms. The silicate fiber has been implicated in carcinogenesis, is chemically inert and can remain in, in a person's lung for the lifetime. Epidemiologic studies have confirmed the association between asbestos exposure and certain lung can disease such as pulmonary fibrosis, fibrosis, mesothelioma and lung cancer. Most asbestos exposure occur in the workplace, for example among the shipyard workers or plumbers. In a study of British asbestos workers, the relative risk of lung cancer was 1.4 to 2.6. Asbestos most likely acts as tumor promoter, as smoking is known to impair bronchial clearance. It is reasonable to assume that smoking prolongs the presence of asbestos in the pulmonary epithelium. In addition, asbestos might enhance the mutagenity of tobacco carcinogens. When smoking is combined with asbestos, exposure to relative risk of lung cancer is 
strikingly increase to 28.8. Radon. Radon is naturally occurring decade product of ur uranium. It is colorless, odorless, chemically inert gas that can penetrate the earth's crust and accumulate in the buildings. Radon decays to product that emit heavy ionizing alpha particle which may damage the DNA in respiratory epithelial cell. Radon exposure increases the risk of developing lung cancer, usually the small cell type among uranium miners who smoke the risk of developing lung cancer is 10 times that of their non-smoking colleagues. Based upon epidemiologic studies in the United States and Europe, residential exposure is clearly associated with an increased risk of lung cancer and is estimated to account for 2,100 and 2,900 cases annually in the United States. Diet. Diet might also influence risk for lung cancer. Studies in the field have focused on the intake of fruits, vegetables, and specific micronutrients. The effect of smoking compounds these studies in that smokers might in the aggregate have a less healthy lifestyle and diet than non-smokers. Also, the detrimental effect of the smoking far exceeds the potential protective effect of diet or nutrition. Many studies have examined the effect of fruit intake on lung cancer incidence. The results have not been consistent with the majority of studies showing no protective effect. The majority of studies that examined vegetable consumption in the relation to lung cancer did show a protective effect. No studies have shown an increased incidence of lung cancer with increased fruit or vegetable consumption. These data combined with data on other tumor types prompted the National Cancer Institute to recommend consumption of five or more serving of fruits and vegetables daily. The agents in fruits and vegetables that result in the decreased incidence of lung cancer remain unknown. Several studies have examined the effect of carotenoids, retinol, and vitamin C. Studies that examined the effect of dietary retinol intake on lung cancer incidence found mixed effect with some studies showing a protective effect and others showing no effect. Several studies have demonstrated an inverse correlation between serum beta-carotene levels and the incidence of lung cancer. Increased intake of carotenoids in general and beta-carotene in particular has been linked with a decreased risk of lung cancer, although other studies did not show this protective effect. Vitamin C might also prevent lung cancer, although some studies don't confirm a protective effect. Surprising results, however, came from three large-scale randomized trials that examined the effect of beta-carotene on lung cancer risk. The alpha-tocopherol beta-carotene trial enrolled 
29,133 male smokers 50 to 69 years old and randomly assigned them to one of four regimens alpha tocopherol 50 mg day beta carotene 20 mg day both alpha tocopherol and beta carotene or placebo patients were followed up for five to eight years no reduction in the incidence of lung cancer was observed among the men receiving alpha tocopherol Patient receiving beta-carotene alone or in combination with alpha-tocopherol at a higher incidence of lung cancer and 8% higher mortality from lung cancer and heart disease. Then the patient not receiving beta-carotene. Similar results were obtained in beta-carotene and retinol efficiency trial. CARET was a multi-center randomized trial that enrolled uh, 18,314 men and women smokers who were treated with both beta-carotene and retinyl palmitate Among the carotene and retinol treated patients, the relative risk of lung cancer was 1.28 and of death from lung cancer was compared with placebo treated patients. The physician's health study randomized 22% of 71 healthy male physicians to placebo or beta-carotene treatment, arms there were no significant difference between smokers and no smokers, non-smokers in the incidence of lung cancer after 12 years of follow-up. Several other large trials assessing the connection between vitamin supplements and cancer incidents have been reported in the physician's health study to 14,641 male physician aged 50 years or older were randomized in the double blind placebo control Factorial trial of vitamin C and E running from 1997 to 2007 and with a median follow-up time of 8 years there was no effect of vitamin or vitamin E versus placebo on the incidence of total cancer or of any side specific cancer analyzed including lung. A study using combined data from two large Norwegian randomized double blind placebo control trials of folic acid and vitamin B12 and homocysteine lowering agents in the cardiovascular disease demonstrated and increase in overall cancer incidence which was primarily driven by the increase in the lung cancer cases. The reasons for the discrepancy between the epidemiologic data and the chemo prevention studies are unclear. Certainly fruit and vegetables contain complex array of micronutrients that might influence cancer incidence, modulate the effect of biologic doses of various agents, including beta carotene, alpha tocopherol, or retinol.
other factors. Environmental or industrial exposure to arsenic, chromium, chloromethyl ether, vinyl chloride, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons increases lung cancer risk. Pre-existing lung disease such as tuberculosis, silicosis, and pulmonary fibrosis is also associated with an increased lung cancer incidence. The risk of lung cancer appears to be increased in individuals with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, even when correcting for the degree of secret consumption these findings are most consistent with the idea that pathophysiologic pathways common to both process such as chronic inflammation can drive the tumorigenic process providing the ra rational for clinical study of agents such as the COX-2 cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, you remember. Genetic predisposition so many details prevention of lung cancer that smoking cessation and prevention Different details, early detection, chemo prevention, molecular biology, adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma is the most common subtype the continuum lung cancer at different types. Adenocarcinoma is the most common subtype. Subtype of non-small -cell, non cell lung cancer in the United States and constitutes 41% of all non-small cell lung cancer cases. Although adenocarcinoma is associated with smoking, it is especially predominant among women and non-smokers. These tumors are classically peripheral and arise from surface epithelium or bronchial mucosal glands and as peripheral scar carcinomas. On histologic examination, adenocarcinoma demonstrates glands formation papillary structures or mucin production. Patients with adenocarcinoma frequently present with metastatic disease before symptoms of the primary cancer are evident. Pulmonary adenocarcinoma can be associated with hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy and Trousseau syndrome the bronchoalveolar subtype of adenocarcinoma is the distinct clinicopathologic entity. It can present as solitary peripheral nodule, multicentric disease or rapidly progressing pneumonic involvement. It can occur as early as the second decade of life, the characteristic clinical presentation is multiple, multiply pulmonary nodules. Squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma or epidermoid carcinoma, formerly the most common subtype of non-small cell lung cancer, is now the second most frequent, accounting for 34% of non-small cell lung cancer, this tumor arises most frequently in the proximal bronchi because of its central location and the tendency of these cells to exfoliate. Squamous cell carcinoma can often be detected by cytologic examination of the sputum, 
With time, these tumors tend to cause bronchial obstruction with resultant atelectasis or pneumonia. Pneumonia, they also tend to remain localized and cavitate. Of all the subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer, the squamous cell variety has the strongest association with smoking. Pathologically, it is characterized by visible keratinization with prominent desmosomes and intracellular bridges, increased secretion of PTHRP in squamous cell carcinoma has led to association of the subtype, subtype, the hypercalcemia. Large cell carcinoma, the least common subtype of non-small cell lung cancer, like large cell carcinoma account for approximately 8% of all non-small cell lung cancer refinements in histopathologic techniques have led to the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma or small cell squamous cell carcinoma in the cases previously diagnosed and undifferentiated large cell carcinoma. Clinical presentation Clinical presentation The sign and symptoms of lung cancer are related to the specific location of tumor masses and the occurrence of paraneoblastic syndromes. Some patients present asymptomatically with the lung mass discovered on the routine chest x-ray or screening computer tomography scan the number of patients who fall into this category might increase if screening for lung cancer increases the symptoms of centrally located lesions include cough hemoptysis wheezing stridor dyspnea and post-obstructive pneumonia. Peripheral lesion can cause pain due to pleural or chest wall invasion, cough or restrictive dyspnea. Lesions involving the intrathoracic nerves can cause several syndromes. Panko syndrome, which is characterized by shoulder pain radiating to the arm in an ulnar ulnar distribution pre-arm front arm uh, is caused by tumor invasion of the eighth cervical and first thoracic nerves in the superior sulcus Horner syndrome which consists of Enophthalmos, enophthalmos, butosis, meiosis, and ipsilateral dyshidrosis can be caused by extension of the tumor into the uh, paravertebral uh, sympathetic nerves because the left recurrent laryngeal nerve passes through the aorticopulmonary window it is the susceptible to injury secondary to mediastinal limb node involvement such injury cause vocal cord paralysis with subsequent hoarseness tumor invasion of the mediastinum can cause paralysis of the phrenic nerve which in turn can cause elevation of the Hemidiaphragm. Patients with pleural effusion often, often present with dyspnea or cough. Pericardial effusion, secondary to the pericardial invasion, can cause shortness of breath. 
or topne tachycardia chest pain and physical signs of tamponade superior vena cava syndrome with the swelling of the face and arm and superficial venous engorgement can be caused by either a central tumor in the right lung or mediastinal lymphadenopathy dysphagia can result from compression of the esophagus non small cell lung cancer is frequently metastatic and symptoms secondary to metastasis are common the most common site for metastasis are listed table 157 most common sites of lung cancer metastasis hilar and mediastinal lymph nodes pleura opposite lung liver adrenal gland bone central nervous system bone metastasis can be associated with pain pathologic fracture or spinal cord compression liver metastases are often asymptomatic but can be associated with pain or jaundice if obstruction of the releasing of the uh, jaundice cold blood releasing the secretion Central nervous system metastases are often indicated by seizure, headache, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status, or focal neurologic signs. Weight loss due to tumor-related cachexia is a very common presenting symptom and an independent adverse prognostic factor. The production of ectopic hormones or hormone-like substance is not uncommon in lung cancer and result in paraneoplastic syndromes. These have been described most commonly, commonly with uh, small cell lung cancer, but also occur uh, in non-small cell lung cancer. These have been paraneoplastic syndrome. I mean, these have been described most commonly with small cell lung cancer, but also occur in non-small cell lung cancer. Cancer cachexia is the only paraneoplastic syndrome that is common in non-small cell lung cancer. It is characterized by weight loss, impaired immune function, weakness, and decline the per performance status, weight loss in the setting in distinct from that due to uh, poor nutritional intake or anorexia caused by tumor involvement of the gastrointestinal tract. The exact mechanism for development of cachexia is unknown. Generally, you know, too much consumption and too much waste product dependence of the cancer neoplastic condition character these negative waste metabolites general homeostatic metabolic suppressive effect onto enzymes and too so much so many biological mechanism and at the end uh, additionally our renal renal nephrotic uh, inefficiently filtration cause auto intoxication if uh, the additionally supported this negative condition with chemotherapy 
or combined radiotherapy, our metabolic homeostatic normal functional strongly deeply suppressed. That's all uh, the continual detailed staging diagnosis pulmonary mass and some figures uh, show us uh, the metastasis of the different bones treatment stage one and two pieces different uh, photographs figures MRI and computer tomography stage 3 disease acuan therapy stage 4 disease uh, terminal at once the stage and other detailed uh, just uh, for doctors, physicians, not a public health education program existence. And last, last last uh, comment conclusions non-small cell lung cancer remains one of the most devastating illnesses in the United States and worldwide in terms of incidence and overall mortality rates primary prevention achieved by smoking cessation and smoking prevention is the only well-established mechanism of reducing the number of people affected by lung cancer improve screening strategy and effective chemo prevention regimes are essential but have been frustrating and are being persuaded aggressively Surgery offers the potential for significant long-term survival in those patients who have early localized disease. Unfortunately, 70% of non-small cell lung cancer patients have regional, nodal, or metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. Multimodality therapies offer some hope of improving survival of patients with locally advanced disease, but current therapies are inadequate for patients with metastatic disease. Multiply new therapeutic approaches based upon a better understanding of the molecular heterogeneity of tumor or identification of driving genetic events along with improved methods of identifying and selecting patients for particular therapies have shown promise in clinical trials and further study is ongoing that's all this program and i hope we will be continuing Head and neck cancer, our next program, public health education series. You are patiently listened these cancer programs thank you so much thank you very much and see you soon